Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. After two years of extensive drought coupled with a grueling freeze, gardeners are looking for options that can handle both. Today we preview the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's Garden Tour, a chance to pick up design ideas with hardy plants. Right now let's visit one of the gardens. In their new home and garden design, environmentally committed owners Griffin and Heather connected with garden designer Glee Ingram. First on the list, to restore the native plants. The property literally was eclipsed by invasive growth like bamboo and ligustrum and nandina and some Italian jasmine. You couldn't even see the existing wonderful trees like live oak and chin oak and cedar elm, and mountain laurel and buckeyes. They were invisible and out of sight. So it was really, it, it was kind of hard to see what was even possible at the beginning. Glee's restoration began long before she added new plants. I got to come in first uh, and clear the invasives uh, so that there was an opening up and I knew that would give them time, the other healthy native plants, to recover and we did some soil amendments around the existing native trees and, and then left them on their own. And We put protections around all of them for the construction process so that construction traffic was uh, directed as much as possible on a hard access site like this. So that happened a year before I even got to get to real serious construction work. Next was to gently tame the ski slope grade. I grew up on construction yards. My dad designed and built con uh, custom homes and so I grew up watching that happen, you know playing in the yards, building my own little brick house and walls <laughs> while my dad was building bigger ones. So it sort of came maybe in my DNA and certainly in the process of growing up with that. And then I took courses in, you know, how you figure out elevations. Her experience paid off in this site. It's hard to dig down five inches and you hit really um, hard caliche and bedrock. So big, big boulders just popped out of the ground and we reused them on site. Working with stonemasons, she designed a primary spine for travel with what they'd unearthed. There's a hundred foot long walkway built of really large boulders. Uh, there's a drop of 20 feet in that length of run. Glee and the stonemasons put everything to use, crafting remnants and shards for walls and terraces. They were very gifted at their work, so they would take these scraps and stack walls with them. And that's how we got our terraces, and we started from the bottom and came, came up. Glee planned family destinations without disrupting the plants she'd saved. In terms of the, the areas of the garden, the what I call the social area, the social use area, is the patios and the terraces and the, the really nice steps to walk on and the pool. There's destinations and there's places to stop and have some activity or another that people can enjoy together. When adding new plants, Glee went for diversity, especially with natives. The result, the return of diverse wildlife. The family's rescued dogs like clamoring around on the rocks, but for some things, a little zoysia grass was in order. There was a resolution not to have a lawnmower or any grass at the beginning and their five dogs just didn't get that at all. The utility area also houses rainwater collection. Two tanks handle most irrigation needs, including the vegetable garden and fruit trees. In front, Glee stuck with deer-resistant plants. But to enjoy wildlife at the entrance view, David Mahler of Environmental Survey Consulting built a stream along the front of the house. It was a a constrained area. It was a narrow area between the drive and the house and we needed to do something with it to make it 
feel more natural and more welcoming. They extend the water theme to welcome friends with a seep wall that softens a structural column. Sculptor Chris Levac designed the broader view entrance greeting. It's the focal point from the front door and there's this wonderful arch made out of uh, cedar wood that kind of frames those trees. Chris also designed the ironwork that keeps the dogs in and the deer out of the back garden. Structure is an element in this native plant garden that responds to every season. Plants have their moments of glory before going dormant and others take over. It's a cycle that renews this renovated land to its roots. I think Trying to create picture perfect all the time is what really has caused so much damage. We all need rest. Actually, a native plant garden is always picture perfect. Because it belongs here, because it prospers here, because it helps the health of the whole community, because it gives a sense of place, a unique place in the United States. You know, when you travel around and you get to feel different places, it, uh, it's a, the integrity of an experience that belongs uniquely to Central Texas. This is just so seductive, this kind of beauty and health. Some of us are really motivated to make sure that we get to experience it. Oh, that's just one of the beautiful gardens that you'll be able to tour on the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's Gardens on Tour event, which is coming up on the Saturday before Mother's Day. Always a special time for Austin area gardeners. And joining me now to talk about the rest of the homes on the tour is Andrea DeLong Amaya from Hi. the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Welcome back to the show, Thank Andrea. You. Always one of my favorite shows of the year, talking about the Wildflower Center tour. And it looks like you've got a, yet another great uh, lineup of uh, and a mix of homes, uh, garden uh, design studios, and the Wildflower Center itself. Yeah, I think it's always fun to, well, it's fun to look at gardens, uh, <laughs> other people's gardens, right, new gardens, right. uh, but we try to have a good mix of things. So we have big projects. We have a lot more smaller or medium-sized mm -hmm. projects this year than we've had in the past as well. Right. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a fun day. Yeah, well, some really cool-looking stuff. I, I have to say I'm very excited about it. Now, um, as always, one of the traditions of the tour is that it is uh, it uh, includes a pass to the Wildflower Center for the day. Mm -hmm. And um, there are, it's a beautiful time of year to visit, number one. Number two, there's some new features that people can visit. Yeah, I'm very excited. This um, new since last year, since last fall, we've installed two new gardens. One of them is a smaller garden. It's one of the theme gardens in the back, mm -hmm. and it's an edible native plants garden. Cool. People are really finding that interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so there are things like chili pekin and nopals, right. uh, nopales, um, things that you wouldn't think were edible, like spider warts. How mm -hmm. cool is that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's a fun project. And then we have another new garden that we opened up, which is the Texas Mixed Border Garden. And it's it's modeled after like an English cottage style garden. Uh -huh. And it's uh, our native plants lend themselves very well to that kind of border where things come and go and change throughout the season. So mm -hmm. it's a nice, intimate, very residential feel to it. Cool. Cool. So mm -hmm. uh, don't just because you've been to the Wildflower Center before doesn't mean things aren't changing. There's always changing. more to see. It's All, always changing. And it's always changing. So it's that's been part of the tour. <laughs> part of the, exactly right. Now the first of the residential uh, gardens that we're going to talk about is located on Eanes Circle, which I'm taking as West Lake, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a <clears throat> uh, house with, with a lot of shade and a lot of stunning oak trees. Yes. Now, what, what, what's your sense of this garden? And I know that it, they've divided the space uh, very carefully. Yeah, it's a pretty small lot. It's like an average, uh, to maybe a little bit small um, lot. So mm -hmm. if you have a small garden, this is a great uh, garden to get some ideas of how you can maximize the use of the space. Um, they're very interested in having spaces that people can spend time in. So the mm -hmm. front yard, when you walk up, <clears throat> there's kind of a square courtyard in the front yard that has a, a, a water fountain with a big stone in it. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think that's in the picture. In, right. In the it, it's, a, it's not just a big stone. It's this looks big. like an enormous <laughs> boulder. It's right? very cool. Right. And so you go through there on your way up to the front door, right. and then in the back, the backyard is, like I said, fairly small, but they've managed to fit in a deck, and then there's a small seating area around a fire pit. Mm -hmm. They also have a dry creek, and the whole property is certified wildlife habitat, mm -hmm. um, and with obviously a mixture of different native plants. Right. Well, I, you know, I love gardens that are very social, mm -hmm. that have gathering places. So I'm looking forward to seeing this one. And uh, it looks like the stonework throughout is just stunning. Yeah, it's very, it's it's a nice a mixture of different kinds of styles that you can get ideas from. Definitely. Okay, so lots of natives, uh, great functional social spaces. Sounds like a great one for the tour. The next garden that we're going to take a look at is 1503 Ridgecrest. Mm -hmm. And this is one um, that... Uh, you know, it's in deer country, yes. and they don't water. <laughs> How can they have a garden? <laughs> That's what I think is so interesting about this particular project is um, the homeowners did not, they wanted to have minimal maintenance and no irrigation, and, of course, dealing with the deer. So um, they have a lot of structural and textural plants with the agaves and, and grasses. There are a few flowers tucked in there, but it's mostly a texture plant kind mm. of garden space. And what I think is really interesting about that project is how they've worked the landscape to uh, unify with the architecture. It's a mid-century modern style home mm -hmm. uh, that they've remodeled and it works beautifully with that simple plant palette and the elegance of the home. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is talking with the designer Robert Leeper. Um, he actually took the color of the bark on a persimmon trees that were naturally there on the property and use that to inspire the colors for the house. Ah, so the, okay. he's really blended. The beautiful the, silvery yeah, gray, it's which beautiful. is, yeah, it is a, a, one of my favorite things to see in a garden. I love the, the, the Texas persimmon. Now, uh, and I'm a sucker, you know, for agaves and big structural <laughs> plants, but mm -hmm. in, in, in the, the, the pictures I've seen here, I love the counterpoint between the structural plants and the grasses. And to me, the that's The firm always... texture of the agaves and the soft, wispy grasses that right. move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that's beautiful. A, it's, it's always a winner with me. And so I, I think this is going to be a great uh, one for folks to visit and be inspired by. And uh, also get some ideas about the colors, because I think there's some very... You mentioned the fact that uh, he has this attentive eye for color. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So we'll look forward to seeing that one, too. The next one is really completely different. And this is one, this is more of an in-town home. It's on West Monroe Street. Oh, yes. And uh, this is really kind of a cottagey feel, to, uh, at least for what I can tell from the, the images I've seen. Yeah, it's a typical South Austin home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, again, a average lot size. The front yard um, handles the turf issue a little bit differently than normal. Instead of having turf grass, they've used a lot of different, or a lot of uh, sedges. It's a beautiful sedge meadow, really. Mm -hmm. um, nice, very lovely stonework that leads up to the house, and then it's peppered with other native plants that give color and interest at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. So that's the front yard. Then along the side, they've also maximized that space. There's another uh, a dry creek bed that uh, deals with stormwater, mm -hmm. and a beautiful custom bridge that crosses from the driveway. Mm -hmm way to the home right. and in the backyard it's um, mostly shady and there's a nice little seating area they do rainwater harvesting so there's some tanks back there and they mm -hmm. have a compost pile so they're trying to be as self-sufficient on the property as possible well which is always smart yeah. and 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 again <clears throat> again to me it sounds like a really clever organization of the space Mm -hmm. You know, in utilization space. Maximizing what you have. Right. You know, and, and I think that's important as a lot of people's lots get downsized and, and they live, they're moving closer together as our area gets ever denser. Uh, you know, creating these garden spaces that uh, meet a variety of different needs, including being sustainable in terms of mm -hmm. uh, the rainwater harvesting, et cetera. Absolutely. So sounds like a, a, folks can t take home a lot from that particular uh, garden experience. Now, um, the next one is, is really intriguing to me because this is a this is not a residence. It's actually a garden design studio. Right, uh, yeah, Tate Mooring Studio, and mm -hmm. it's right on Bee Caves Road, so we're asking people to park on the side street, and that's mm -hmm. all that information's in right. our book. Um, but, yeah, that's a studio, but it's... it's uh, in an old bungalow. It's in a nice old house, so it feels very residential. And they've been working on the landscape for years, and it's it's really interesting because there's all these little spaces. The property itself is huge. Um, 17, 17 acres. acres. <laughs> Which, to me, is kind of mind-blowing, you know? Yeah, what do you do with 17 acres? That's... And, 
And they've been expanding it. You know, they've yeah. started right around the house, and then they've been adding new garden spaces mm -hmm. to it. Um, and so it feels very residential, yeah. even though it's a commercial property. Yeah, and and in keep we'll talk more about the specifics of the garden, but in keeping with the mission and uh, of the Wildflower Center, one of the things I've read about this is that they've been just hyper diligent removing the invasive non-native species. And to think of uh, trying to accomplish that on a 17 acre scale, big, almost, it is a kind of amazing project. <laughs> because you know, I mean, close to town here, all the properties are invaded with nandinas and ligustrums yeah. and privets and china berries and things like that. Huge task. Huge task. And a and commitment. They, and they, yeah, and they're committed to the invasive plants removal, but they're also uh, plant geeks, so they have a wonderful collection of different species uh, as well. Kinds of, what kinds of uh, plant geeks are we talking about here? <laughs> well, they, they do <laughs> landscaping as a business, so I think they sort of use it as their testing ground ah. before they use them on large-scale okay. projects. Okay. Yeah. Um, lots of cool other features as well. Um, one of the, the centerpieces of, of this garden is a fabulous kind of wall of memories, I guess, is what I would call yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I think Tate has collected a lot of stuff over the years, different rocks, interesting pieces of shell, glass, knickknacks, art, art that he's incorporated into this beautiful walls that he mm -hmm. has surrounding certain areas of the gardens. Yeah. He has a number of little water features, which is fun. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are just little watering holes for wildlife. Um, lots of different spaces and seating areas, sculpture. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really an interesting uh, place to, to tour around and explore. Yeah, I remember uh, Jill Noakes' garden wall where she tucked in it's, all these... It reminds me a lot like of that, yeah. You know, and, and that so inspired so many people here in Central Texas and continues to, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that the personalization of the garden space, and, and, you know, and I collect stone. Every time I go to a different part of the country, a different part of the world, I bring stones back in my I luggage. Tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And, and the airlines, it's getting tricky. Yeah, right. <laughs> what are you going to do with a stone? <laughs> so real briefly, Saturday before Mother's Day, mm -hmm. and people can pick up tickets, uh, I guess, online and at a variety of other locations. That's right. We will be having our tickets uh, available. Uh, you can buy a wristband that gets you mm -hmm. into all of the gardens for the okay. whole day. Uh -huh. uh, we'll have those available online. Also, we have a list of garden centers that will be vending those for us, and that is all on our website. Good. Uh, and also people can purchase wristbands or tickets for individual gardens the day of the tour. Okay, well, very good. Well, thank you mm -hmm. so much for being thank you. here. And uh, wildflower.org is uh, the website. That's and right. coming up next is Daphne Richards. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week is from Lori, who has a treasured Sirius Peruvianus that she's had a little accident with and she wants to know what to do about it. This plant was in a container, of course, and she was rolling it and bro it broke in half when it hit a doorway. She wants to know, is the remaining section in the container going to survive this shock? And then also, can the plant, the top section that broke off, can she replant that? Well, let's start with the top section. You actually need to let this section heal over, which means to allow it to dry out the cut section, the broken section, so that it has kind of a scar over it and it's not leaking plant juices anymore. Once you do plant that, you need to use a very loose soil mixture or cactus potting soil. And you do need to stake that plant because it has no roots. It has no ability to stabilize itself and stay upright. And then also how long before you stick this broken section into soil and then how often should you water it? It takes about a week for that section to heal over, and then once you do plant it, don't water it too much. This plant has maybe grown in too much shade for a little while and gotten a little tall for its container, although it's probably not root-bound. Plants that are sun plants need lots of sun, and when they're grown in shade, those cells stretch and become thinner, making that tissue weaker and more susceptible to breakage. But accidentally bumping this plant into the doorway is probably the real culprit here. It's probably not root bound, as I said, and the original plant that was not broken and is still in the container probably does not need to be replanted. Our plant this week is Turk's Cap, Malva viscus arboreus. It's another great native plant for us, which is seen all around our area in woody areas and natural growth. It does die to the ground in winter and come back from the roots really likes full sun, but it also does great and will flower for you in shade. It flowers late in the spring and also early summer after many of our other wildflowers have gone to seed and are no longer flowering. It has gorgeous red flowers, so it's perfect for a little burst of color after much of your garden may have stopped flowering. 
can get as tall as six feet, so it may, you may need to prune it to keep it in bounds. It's listed as low water use, so you only need to water it occasionally, especially once you've established it, depending on how much spring rainfall we've had. It may get frozen back by extremely cold temperatures, such as we had this winter, but if that happens, the plant will come back. It's time this week to fertilize any vegetable transplants that you might have put out. Your peppers, your tomatoes, if you planted those at least a few weeks ago, go ahead and give them a little burst of fertilizer because you don't need to fertilize them at planting time, which will maybe burn those plants when they're so young. They've established some roots now and just give them a light dose of fertilizer. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg and send us a question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgul for Backyard Basics. Hello gardening friends, welcome to Backyard Basics. Let me talk about lawns today. We don't think, I don't think we've ever covered that before, but um, a lot of people have them, and um, I'd like to see the lawns go away actually, put in some native plants, change everything, grow vegetables out front, but that's not gonna happen very soon. People really like their lawns, they need them for kids to play on, for their pets to play on. It's a nice, cool area, so you're gonna see the lawn stay, but maybe reduced, and managed organically. It's easy enough to do also, it's very easy to do. Nobody's ever lost a lawn because they went organic. And organics um, don't pollute. For example, the fertilizer 824, that's the one that the uh, city of Austin recommends. And uh, they recommend it because it's a fine little fertilizer, does a great job, and it does not move through the soil profile into our creeks and streams. The chemicals do. And the lawn can look very, very nice. Nice, thick, green blades, strong runners. That's what we're looking for when uh, we go organic. Another thing to help us when we've gone organic, whether a lawn is brand new or you've just got it out there for quite some time, you can help revitalize it a little bit when you use some seaweed. Seaweed builds cell vigor, so if you're going off into the summer, you want a sturdier grass. If you're going into the winter, same thing. Uh, seaweed has a bunch of hormones that uh, cause different things to happen. For example, if you've just laid some sod, well, when you spray it with the seaweed, it'll stimulate growth uh, much more quickly. You know, these are very good products. We also like to use compost tea to, uh, well, compost has a lot of nutrients, but it has the ability to suppress disease also. So these are some products I would use out there, but this is the most important one of them all right here. That's compost. Look at this picture. Half of the yard was treated with compost and the other wasn't. I'll bet you can tell very easily which one it was. And the answer is yes, it's that green side. Another thing that happens out in the yard is we run into problems uh, with insects, and these are devastating. Usually you see a lot of damage. Look at this. These are the chinch bugs, and they're doing damage right out in the lawn. You usually see it right in a hot spot where the, um, the uh, curve meets the lawn itself, and in that hot spot right there, well, that's where the chinch bugs are. And they need to be managed. You know, you just can't leave them alone. Some people will use uh, the diatomaceous earth. Others will use insecticidal soap. And there's several other things from the organic gardener's closet that um, we can use out there. Insects can be another problem also. And for example, fire ants. We all have to deal with fire ants around here. This is an all organic product that controls fire ants and it does a wonderful job. It works very quickly. I've never seen it not work. And you can use it in a vegetable garden. It's the only one that you can use out in a vegetable garden. And that really indicates to me the safety of that product. Grubs, grubs in the lawn, grubs are a problem out there. And so um, one of the things that we like to recommend, and it also does um, the fire ants, is the beneficial nematode. The beneficial nematode goes a very long way at suppressing uh, critters that are doing damage in the home landscape. And one of the things it's more famous for than anything else is getting rid of the fleas that are out in the lawn very safely, but more important than that, very, very effectively. There are diseases that affect the lawn also, and um, uh, Serenade and Actinovate are two great products that will help suppress those diseases effectively. 
It does no good to spray it if it doesn't give you the control. Those things give you the control. And one of the things that build up in the lawn is thatch. When it's a chemical-oriented lawn, there are no microbes left. As a result of that, um, we begin to see thatch build up, like this right here. These are the runners in the rhizomes. These aren't the leaves. They're full of lignans, and they have a real hard time breaking down through microbial activity or limited microbial activity activity and so you got to get that healthy organic lawn and you'll begin to see the thatch disappear. So here's a few ideas for you. You want a healthy, good-looking lawn, free of insects or diseases? Take an organic approach to it. You can really do a good job and in reality have the prettiest lawn in the neighborhood. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next time. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and visit our blog. Next week, check out the upcoming Master Gardener Tour. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.